up uh, from sunny uh, Del Mar in California, just outside of San Diego. Uh, hope everyone is having a great summer um, as we sort of round out uh, the rest of August. Um, thank you for attending and signing up for uh, managing uh, private equity corruption risks. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides, uh, please email me at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com. You'll see it right there. Um, also, I'm going to try to handle questions as we're going along, if you have any or any uh, particular issues. Obviously, if you have any technical issues, please let me know. Uh, I'm hoping uh, it's a far cry to do a webinar from Sicily, from Sicily as opposed to Del Mar, California. So. Uh, uh, today's uh, subject is, uh, you know, one that's sort of overdue, I think, in a lot of respects, and we'll get into it in a minute. I want to just do, do a couple commercial uh, plugs here. One is we do work with private equity companies on anti-corruption compliance. We have several clients in that space. Um, and uh, there are, as we will go through this, I'm going to explain to you sort of the set of, you know, uh, unique corruption risks that come up and how to address those issues, uh, particularly in this enforcement environment, um, and uh, try to push people in the private equity space into uh, one area where I think they don't spend enough time on is creating a culture, uh, you know, an organizational type culture uh, from the top level of the private equity company among their portfolio companies, and we'll talk about that. Um, Control issues are obviously very important, and we help with that. Risk ranking formulas are critical when it comes to portfolio companies and managing your risks and creating uh, audit and monitoring type programs in a situation. We do all of this. Uh, we're pretty reasonably priced, uh, and we um, try to provide specialized services that uh, are practical in nature, don't frustrate your business, but yet provide you the legal protections, the documentary protections that you need uh, to protect the company and, and still promote uh, what I would say a culture of ethics uh, as a valuable sort of uh, resource. Uh, secondly, uh, Volkoff Law TV, which we announced I can't uh, probably a month or so ago, um, we, uh, these webinars are added to that and then not available. Uh, for replay, uh, except we do have, we created a new sort of pricing structure, uh, reduced prices, but more importantly offered individual webinar access for a month for $8. Um, uh, the service has been pretty well received. We appreciate that and the support. Um, the one thing also, if you have an enterprise or a group of people who would like to get access, we offer real uh, with discounts. Obviously, all my webinars during the year, 20 or so, are put on to uh, this service, and so I'm going to cover a range of topics. For some enterprises, we've even offered uh, to do two or three topics on uh, issues of specific concern to that enterprise. So it works out pretty well. I love using the term enterprise like it's Star Trek. I mean, I'm talking about for companies or you know partnerships, whatever. Um, so uh, there also is a discount. Uh, it actually goes beyond June 2015. It goes into September 2015, and it's Volkov 10, and you get an additional 10% discount on uh, uh, either the monthly or the annual fee. So uh, check it out. I think it's a pretty good service, uh, if I say so myself, but it, we're trying to make it uh, helpful uh, and support to people. Um, okay, so let's talk about private equity and hedge funds, uh, what we're going to get into today, the current enforcement picture, which I think has changed rapidly uh, over the last few years, uh, foreign official interactions, which is uh, an important area of enforcement right now, successor liability and portfolio companies, uh, I see as sort of an issue coming, uh, and I've always said that it's going to come down the road, but I think um, what usually is going to happen uh, in this context is uh, people will start to get on the radar screen of the government through the foreign official interactions and then boom all of a sudden they're going to look at what are you doing in portfolio uh, your management of portfolio companies 
Um, the thing about private equity is that there's so much money in it that we've had many sort of lawyers and compliance people running around screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and the sky hasn't fallen. On the other hand, um, I do think there are some important uh, trends developing, and uh, the government is getting their meat hick hooks into some companies, and I think this is going to lead to a bigger trend. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be the next industry sweep, but there is a chance for it, and I'll tell you why I think that, because there are some uh, important sort of uh, under the radar type of things that are going on in these investigations. Uh, so I would, uh, yeah, I think it's worth uh, monitoring the situation, uh, because I think it's going to get more interesting uh, in the next, particularly this year. Uh, private equity is clearly uh, a prime target, and I do mean that it could become the next sweep candidate. I mean, we've had oil and gas, we've had, uh, you know, the healthcare, pharmaceutical, and medical devices, and, you know, a quote unquote sweep, which is usually just a, a lot of BS meant to promote law firms and, you know, please scare me, you know, scare everyone into uh, hiring us. But the sweep here that I think could hand, uh, happen, a sweep is really equivalent to. Um, having huge amounts of uh, government interactions, not just on the regulatory side. I'm talking about foreign government interactions for business purposes, and that's what we have here uh, when we get into so sovereign wealth funds. Um, private, neither private equity, I mean, none of these funds, let's be honest, have any extensive history or experience in anti-corruption compliance. Um, they, they tend to focus on international companies, uh, and acquire them, and uh, they tend to look for good deals, and these companies are not going to have any type of anti-corruption compliance infrastructure. I mean, this is just a new thing that's going on. Um, I noticed that private, in my view, prior, you know, uh, hedge funds shoot more from the hip. Uh, they don't have as much uh, sort of infrastructure for screening, reviewing things uh, as much as private equity firms do. Uh, and that's just a sort of a cultural sense uh, that I see. Uh, and private equity firms, uh, look, let's be honest, they go, they go in, they, they, cut, they cut costs, they amass portfolios, and then they try to sell and mix and match and sell and make more money. Um, and in doing so, uh, one of the first candidates who are not even on their radar screen is anti-corruption compliance. Um, so this is look, this is an industry ripe for uh, an enforcement action. The government, uh, in, in even a sweep, the government has been sort of chomping at the bit. Um, so here's my reference to my age. Uh, you know, for what it's worth, uh, Buffalo Springfield, there's something happening here, and it is pretty clear, uh, unlike the lyric. Uh, in terms of what's going, what are the trends that I see that could lead to sort of more of a sweep. Number one is, um, look, going back in time when the subpoenas and letters came out to investment banks and some of the private equity funds, uh, you know, from the SEC uh, requesting information about their anti-corruption compliance, it, it did send a shockwave because they're not used to uh, being, you know, hammered, or there's so much money at stake, and there's so much at stake, and they know that they have weaknesses here, that it could lead to something um, uh, pretty serious. So that was a big thing, and it happened. Now everybody sort of sat there. There were all these, you know, client alerts. You better get your 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 act together. You better do this. You better do that. Um, the inquiry focused on uh, interactions with sovereign wealth funds, and that was all of a sudden on the top of the radar screen, anti-corruption compliance, and it stretched to, you know, uh, foreign public institutional investors. So, uh, you know, in some Nordic countries, for example, you have, um, you know, institutional investors run by uh, governments. Um, for let's say the benefit of laborers or government workers or government institutions, so you you see that so the sovereign wealth fund sort of inquiry extended into that. Uh, more importantly, I think we have various investigations that led to what I call the Princelings investigation, which is focused on the hiring of foreign official relatives uh, for internships and other positions. 
probably the most important fact, which is, of course is the last one here, is that DOJ recently joined the investigation uh, in the Princeling investigation, and that is a big deal. So in other words, what started in 2011 as an SEC investigation with letters and subpoenas or whatever, that's civil at that moment. Once DOJ comes on board and starts to join, in quotes, an investigation, there are, they, already, they always have a liaison with the SEC on every SEC investigation just in case something happens. DOJ will assign an attorney to an investigation. They don't come to the meeting. They're just sort of kept apprised. But if something in the SEC finds something, then they tell them. Well, this is more than that. This is more that it's public that DOJ joined the investigation, meaning the criminal penalties are being considered or uh, investigated in the Prinsling matter. And, uh, and what isn't clear yet is whether it's just corporate related or there are certain individuals, although. Uh, there are several uh, specific individuals who may be involved in some of these. So um, this is what I mean in the sense of something is gathering. I do think this might be a big story for this year because several of the two of the targets, and I use that term loosely, not in the U.S. Attorney Manual technical sense, but two of the companies, significant companies, are trying to settle their cases for this year. Now, why is this even more important? And, you know, does Dodd-Frank ever really relate to anti-corruption compliance? It absolutely does. And let's, just as a former prosecutor, you don't want the government in your files. You don't want the government looking around your offices. You don't want the government in there. It's a lot harder for them to find things when they're not, obviously. And um, there's been, a, you know, Dodd-Frank, what it did bring in was greater uh, regulation of private equity funds and even extending to, uh, you know, in this sense, um, extending to registration requirements, but more importantly are these presence exams. So they've conducted over 400 presence exams and they think about what they're looking at private equity funds for. They're looking at private equity funds with regard to the fees that they're charging. Is there shifting of fees? Are they manipulating presentations uh, of, of financial performance? Are they um, manipulating presentations to get certain uh, investments and um, uh, reporting profitability of certain operations versus other operations? Uh, the presence exams puts the government right into an area which is very significant, which is the payment of placement fees, meaning uh, in a traditional sense, private equity funds hire third parties to help them to get access to uh, sovereign wealth funds and other potential high-stakes customers who would invest their money with the private equity company. So what we're looking at here is the FEC is already in their file, already looking around, and this then focuses them on large or unusual fees paid to placement agents or others. And what that is going to do, I think, is you're going to see more sort of inquiries in this area, not necessarily in the princeling area, but in the traditional sort of use of third parties and due diligence systems and what uh, private equity companies have in place uh, to protect against uh, hiring high-risk, uh, high-commissioned, uh, placement agents uh, in this area. So the three primary risks, and I think we've talked about it just generally right now, but just to organize it for us, is the sovereign wealth fund interactions, because uh, we talked about that. Um, and now the hiring of current, former, and relatives for jobs and internships. This to me is probably the biggest set of interaction risks that the government has latched on to. I do think we're going to see the sort of placement agents uh, issue rise up. And the last issue has not become as big, but I think it will become bigger as time moves on, uh, and that is the successor liability and portfolio companies uh, and the management of risk. So the biggest case that right now, and it was actually in the press last week, is, uh, uh, and I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but the OXIF case. Uh, and they, this is a big, big case, and it's a case that they want to settle. 
Um, and it seems to get more and more complicated as time goes on. It initially focused on what I was talking about, the placement fee issue, where there was a London middleman who in turn hired another uh, agent uh, that was helpful then in securing a deal with uh, the Libyan Investment Authority. Now, this goes way back to the Qaddafi issue uh, and the fact that when Qaddafi was toppled, uh, you know, people had predicted that the files and the government, the new government, uh, was going to have an incentive to sort of tarnish uh, Qaddafi's reputation and his son and other people. And they did that by, uh, you know, disclosing as much information about corruption by Qaddafi and his son. Uh, and so this, uh, you know, the Libyan Investment Authority sort of opened their files and just started sending everything out to the governments that they could get uh, attention from. And obviously DOJ uh, got into this. But what happened, though, for OXIF was much worse. Because from this sort of legitimate ex uh, uh, in inquiry, uh, it just led to an expansion into OXIF's total Africa investments. And their sort of political forces, um, uh, you know, got into this again. Um, and there now are examinations of a number of African leaders and uh, funds. And OXIF had a very aggressive sort of African development program and investment program. Uh, and the most recent one, and the reason that this is huge, I think, is that, uh, you know, when you look at the sanctions case that was brought against BNP, one of the headlines from it was, okay, BNP basically engaging in these con in these um, uh, illegal transactions, uh, basically funded organ you know governments uh, like Sudan, which were f uh, supporting uh, Osama bin Laden, and that's just not something you want to come out about your company. And here we have a similar type thing for Oxif, where. Uh, they were engaging, and there were three other companies that were involved with them in giving $100 million um, to a small mining company um, in, that was supposedly connected in Zimbabwe with Robert Mugabe's government in 2008. And it was then uh, used, supposedly, some of these funds to, uh, during the violent repression of the opposition, uh, 2008 was an election year there and Mugabe uh, retained power, and uh, Oxif's, uh, you know, fingerprints are on this, and this is what is the concern. The other companies that were involved were BlackRock and Credit, Credit Suisse, um, and uh, they, they may be under investigation as well. There's an individual who is at the center of the uh, African program who's listed here and is apparently under investigation. Um, and now Oxif is trying to settle the case. I mean, whether this leak that they're settling the case and they want to get rid of it this year is relevant or, or just sort of, you know, um, you know, a, a sort of political move by them uh, to tell the government that they want to do this, um, I don't know. But it's certainly this is a, a spiraling case that shows you sort of the, the dangers of how private equity funds can, through placement agents, through uh, acquisitions of companies that are probably related to government officials, like the small mining company, why would they give $100 million to a very small mining company, um, which was used to funnel money to Zimbabwe President Robert Mugabe. Uh, and there's a, an alleged trip that occurred during this that's very key that their government is focused on of an Oxyop individual going to Africa uh, in connection with this, a different individual other than uh, Michael Cohen. So this shows you how private equity can, uh, let's say, uh, suffer a worst case scenario. Uh, the one issue that we know for sure is that sovereign wealth funds, uh, just like hospitals, just like any other government agency, when you're dealing with them overseas, you might as well assume they're, that everybody there that you deal with is a foreign official for purposes of um, the FCPA. Now, the Esplanade decision in the 11th Circuit has resolved this. I don't see this ever getting questioned again. Um, but what I think this means from a compliance standpoint, and I've told any, any industry, any company that has as depended upon a huge amount uh, or large uh, percentage of revenues 
comes from interactions with foreign officials and the foreign government, it's good to have a separate policy. It's good to even flag it as we are going to talk about when you deal with these people, what are the what you can do, what you can't do, uh, in terms of gifts and hospitality, investments, hiring, family, relationships. What we want to have in through this policy is as much as possible with the organization, within the organization, to have things done knowingly and transparently by having making sure that there are controls in place so that no one person can go out and do whatever the hell he feels like or she feels like. In other words, that there are people reviewing your gifts, your hospitality, your investment strategy, your hiring proposals. Uh, anything that is done, nothing is going to be done without controls in this situation given the interactions and the risky nature of the interactions that you're going to have with foreign officials. People rely upon a hodgepodge of policies cutting across different issues. What I'm saying is think about if it's appropriate to have a separate policy on interactions with state officials, okay, with government officials. And all of, and you can cross-reference your other policies, but put people and controls in place so that those actions and activities are reviewed uh, in some way within the organization. The second case, which, uh, and it, it's interesting because this case has not gotten the same amount of attention, uh, and it really should. And if anything, it should be, it should have been. Um, Really highly focused and publicized among the uh, among the compliance community um, as a way to sort of justify what you're going to do with if you're working within a uh, with a private equity client or within a private equity organization. The BNY Mellon case, they've already gotten Wells notices that keep the company and current and former officials are going to be charged. I mean, the DOJ is not involved in this at this point to at least uh, anybody's knowledge. But the fact is they've already been told they're going to be charged and this occurred not this year but last year. Uh, and it didn't get the attention that I thought people should have uh, focused on it. And uh, I even wrote about it in, in my blog to sort of highlight it. But this was a broad investigation that doesn't have it's not a princeling investigation meaning this is not about hiring practices for Relatives and uh, and uh, you know people connected to certain government officials. This was a much broader type of inquiry that went on to the job offers for current and former government officials. In other words, people who were at sovereign wealth funds in uh, decision making roles. Some who, when they left, would get hired. But there is a question as to whether or not. Uh, there were understandings with these current and former government officials as to BNY Mellon getting certain business. It also then extended to internships for relatives, and I call that sort of more of a princeling type of investigation. So this is a distinct thing from the princeling investigation, and it, uh, it extends to current and former government officials, and it has been growing within the Middle East in terms of BNY Mellon and the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, in terms of, uh, obviously, there's a lot of money in the Middle East for sovereign wealth funds, and there's a lot uh, to do in the, in this situation, um, where there are a lot of risks that can come up, and uh, there are a lot of concerns that can come up uh, as well. So, uh, BNY Mellon is a case that's going to get resolved this year as well, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of you want to talk about atmospherics and the impact this could have. Uh, you, you know, with the OXIF, the BNY Mellon, and then we get to our famous little princeling investigation. Now, everybody has probably heard about this because of, uh, you know, the Morgan Stanley uh, supposedly had a chart, and there was actually even a picture of the chart, I think, in the Wall Street Journal uh, a year or so ago. Uh, the chart that matched up in China certain sovereign wealth contracts that were coming up. Uh, and, uh, you know, talk about a great piece of evidence for the government with um, hiring and specific relatives that were being hired uh, for internships or lower level positions at these various um, organizations. So uh, five banks were actually the original focus. Deutsche Bank has now been added. 
uh, concerning their hiring practices in Asia. What's interesting is that this is not something that's confined just to private equity or banks or whatever, uh, but you know, keep in mind Qualcomm is under, under investigation in China for the same exact issue, which is supposedly the hiring of a government official related to a Qualcomm uh, or relevance of a uh, government official to seek certain benefits. Um, and uh, Credit Suisse, I mean, you have some big players here who are under investigation. Um, we, uh, Morgan Stanley, like I said, has a chart. Um, and look, UBS has put two employees on leave. Uh, they hired the daughter of a fund in China, you know, a government official uh, for a fund. Um, and there's an interesting question here because, uh, of course, the banks leaked it. Uh, they've hired, you know, you have all the usual suspects in terms of New York law firms representing them. And uh, there's been a lot written sort of in the blogosphere and in the, um, uh, in the blogosphere and in the, um, you know, before the uh, SEC and the DOJ as to whether or not these, uh, it, whether the hiring actually violates uh, the FCPA. This is really a very tricky issue that gets into some nuance related to, uh, there were two prior opinion releases in the 80s where uh, DOJ opined on, at that point, on the use of relatives as placement agents uh, and relatives from uh, various uh, government officials. Um, you know, look, in my mind, you can make everything complicated, uh, particularly when it comes to the FCPA, but I always look to two things. One is, uh, was there anything of value? And the question is whether or not the hiring of a relative is uh, something of value to that government official. I can tell you, if you hire my kid, I know it's of value, okay? Uh, believe me, they all need jobs, so please, you know, hire my kids, and I know you're giving me something of value. We all know that uh, that doesn't, that's not a good argument for the New York law firms to make. What is a better argument, uh, and I think they tried to make this, and even Jamie Dimon was uh, quoted as saying, hey, this was, per, this was customary. We did this all the time. Uh, you know, this is in the industry. We didn't have corrupt intent. Well, there's a big difference in my mind between ingrained corrupt intent and off, you know, one of one of a kind sort of corrupt intent. And this question here to me is very clear. Uh, it's going to boil down to the facts. It's going to boil down to the surrounding circumstances. Um, you know, uh, I could see when you have a damning piece of evidence like the chart that Morgan Stanley says. What you do in that case is creative lawyering. Lawyering, you say, hey, if it was so illegal and we thought we were acting with such corrupt intent, why would we put such a, a chart together? Um, it's one, you know, you can go around in circles, and that's the value of lawyering at times. But the question of whether or not this is really corrupt intent or not, and how this is going to play out, um, I uh, am not very confident that the, the government is going to lose in this matter. Frankly, these uh, institutions can't afford to go to trial, so it's really a, a, a persuade the government type of thing. Uh, I do think their arguments, though, and their aggressive sort of response may have some impact on the you know, ultimate settlement and how much is involved. It does raise a question as to criminal uh, liability and uh, whether or not DOJ's participation in this investigation is going to ultimately lead to criminal charges, particularly against an individual. Um, you know, I would uh, be happy to represent that individual uh, because I think it would be a really strong case that you could make that somebody didn't necessarily act with corrupt intent or criminal corrupt intent beyond reasonable doubt. So that that is these are the issues that I see in this area. Now, what's the compliance solution to this? Well, there's a compliance solution to this that's very, very easy. In my mind, uh, if you hire relatives or hire people, there, I've always told clients and worked with clients in particular uh, on this issue, you uh, subject people to uh, the traditional hiring process. You have them re, you know, submit CVs or resumes or whatever is done. You follow the procedures that are in place uh, if it was my son or daughter who was applying. And you follow those procedures and um, 
you know, and in the end, you document as much as you can. Um, do you want to pre, you know, do you want to get a specific outcome? Yes, you want to get a specific outcome, but do not hire somebody that's not qualified for the job just because they're related to a government official. And those are the types of things when people subvert the hiring process is when people get into trouble. Um, you know, I've had several situations with clients where we had very highly qualified uh, people who were related to a government official that they, the government, that the company actually dealt with in a foreign country, but was a very well-educated, very highly qualified person, and we created a record that basically put that person through the process because we knew that that person was going to do well in the process. Uh, I mean, you have an if you're going to interview all the candidates, you interview or you know, let's say a certain select some of the clients of the candidates, then you have you interview the person. You don't just give them the job. So that's what I'm. Uh, there are, as I always say, there there's always a compliance solution to almost every problem uh, that you that you face, and particularly in the hiring of officials and relatives uh, of officials and relatives of the officials and former officials as well. In that sense, uh, there are ways to hire former officials as well as current officials. Um, these are not people that you can't hire for uh, because of the FCPA. You just have to do it right. Okay, so acquisitions, due diligence, and compliance. Uh, and here we get into the area of portfolio companies. And this to me is, uh, it is an underbelly, and I've written about this as an underbelly. It is an area. All we need is one type of oxidative case to occur in this area, and boom, the, uh, the, the sort of, impact that'll have across the private equity industry is going to be huge. Uh, and all we need is one case where the government's in there on, let's say, a sovereign interaction type thing, and they start to, and something comes up with an acquisition, and boom, there we are now looking at what are their policies and how do they handle it. So let's take a, a refresher moment just for a second on successor liability. We know the good old phrase, of you cannot acquire or you can acquire an FCPA violation by acquiring a company. Now there, there's a lot of nuance to this as to whether or not a predecessor company, a successor company gets prosecuted and who gets prosecuted and who's really liable and, and when the timing relating to that liability. But the legal concept of successor liability extends far across the FCPA. It's not something that's unusual, unfair, or ridiculous because it's a well-established principle. Otherwise, everybody would start reorganizing themselves or uh, engaging in certain transactions as ways to avoid liability. That's not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen under any normal regime of uh, law. So, and the F FCPA, uh, context, the one thing that that is important to remember is that a company cannot be held liable uh, for uh, activities of another company. Let's say company A is acquiring company B. Company B was not subject to the FCPA, meaning they were not involved in, in any interactions in the United States. They weren't, uh, they weren't a listed company. They were, you know, conducting activities all within Sweden, and then they get acquired. Now, they are subject to, they're, so they're acquired by a company that is subject to the FCPA based in the United States, let's say, and all of a sudden, company B's activity that occurred prior to that closing and prior to that acquisition can never, never form the basis of an action against company A or obviously company B, uh, company A for violating the FCPA. That's an important principle and people get lost in that sometimes. Um, more importantly though is if company A acquires company B and company B was subject to the FCPA, uh, then you have the company A can be held liable for before or after violations, before or after the closing that are committed by company B. It depends on the situation and it depends on the specific facts, but the fact the, the point is that liability can attach in those situations. Now, why is that relevant? Well, let me, before we even get to that in terms of the private equity context, 
I mean, there are lots of cases. Uh, there's lots of been lots of recent enforcement actions over the last few years that have been based upon successor liability. It is a concept that is alive and well in uh, DOJ and F SEC enforcement strategies. Uh, Goodyear was a SEC case that uh, came down this year, and it was a perfect example. Goodyear acquired two companies, one in Angola, one in Kenya, and uh, they did due diligence. It's not clear whether or not uh, the due diligence, but I think you can infer from it that it didn't include any sort of real anti-corruption compliance due diligence. And all of a sudden, Goodyear got hit with uh, violations that occurred. Um, now, mainly these violations occurred after the acquisition. Um, they did not, and, and that was because there were enough years of sort of violations that, that occurred. Um, uh, they did not get into the question of uh, liability with regard to prior to the closing. But nonetheless, successor liability, there's n numerous cases. There's at least five a year or so that are based on this uh, pre premise. So why is, um, why is this relevant for us when we'll get into successor liability and portfolio companies, but private equity companies are buying and selling companies, uh, portfolio companies, all the time, uh, and they uh, are managing these companies. They may have control of these companies, or they may have less than uh, ownership control, but have board seats, uh, you know, one or two or three or whatever, but they may have a presence on the company, and these all raise serious risks and, and reasons for analyses in the private equity context. But let's talk about uh, the antidote. The antidote uh, in this situation is due diligence. So pre-acquisition due diligence is key. Whether or not uh, company A discovers the violations, look, you've got to at least be able to document to the government that you really focused on this. And by this, and by the way, it is not satisfactory to, you know, send them 20, to send a prospective target for an acquisition. Uh, here are 15 questions, and we may have some follow-ups, and that's about it. You're not going to, that's not robust pre acquisition due diligence. And not only that, think about it from this standpoint. You're going to have to integrate this company into whatever operation you have at that moment. And uh, integration requires understanding and planning and knowing what the heck these people are up to in this uh, acquired company. And for that reason, all you're doing is starting what I would call information collection in the, in the pre-acquisition due diligence phase that's going to be critical for the integration function. So um, the more you can show a robust pre-acquisition due diligence process, the more the DOJ is going to um, sort of bless it and feel like they can trust you and feel like you were really committed to doing something in the situation. Now, do, for, do private equity funds uh, have robust due diligence, yes, but not with regard to anti-corruption compliance. And they need to. I mean, it's just a basic thing. In most companies that I work with, we will adopt a separate due diligence policy, not for third parties or joint venture partners, a separate one that covers mergers and acquisitions. If the company, be it a private equity company or a manufacturing company, has an aggressive acquisition strategy, then I always urge companies to have a separate policy, create a separate infrastructure, and review it and approve it and review it and approve it and set up controls that are going to document what exactly you did. Um, and I've seen situations where DOJ and the SEC have declined prosecution. If there is a, 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 pre a robust pre-acquisition due diligence, and they fail to discover it because the government is not being ridiculous here. They know that due diligence does not mean going in and doing an internal investigation and ripping apart a company. They know that there is a, there is a reliance on certain representations that occur in the due diligence process, not just in the contract, but in the due diligence process itself. So basically, the company A, the acquiring company, is going, their liability is going to turn on their performance of due diligence and whether the company then, and what they did in the post-acquisition context. In other words, what integration procedures they had, what uh, ability they had to, to do certain things um, in terms of training, 
bringing them on the same financial system. One recipe for disaster is not to put the acquired company onto the same sort of financial system. But nonetheless, these are general principles that everybody should know and be very comfortable with and should understand in any context. Why private equity doesn't do this, I don't know. It's not that hard. As I always say, compliance is not as hard as everyone thinks. But due diligence on an acquisition, you're already in there looking at the finance. You're already in there looking at um, everything you can uh, related to their commercial operations. And what is the marginal cost of throwing in or getting involved or assigning one or two people to do the due diligence that's needed uh, on anti-corruption issues. Um, and I tried to, uh, there is an example of what I would call the portfolio company, um, you know, liability. And this was a case uh, that everybody cites in the private equity context, but it was a case that uh, fizzled out because there wasn't uh, any enforcement action. But the government set the, in the Alliance case, which was a big investigation, um, uh, there was, uh, you know, a inquiry based upon uh, possible bribery by a portfolio company in which Alliance held a majority stake. And um, the, the fact is they investigated it. And, and what I'm trying to say to everybody is imagine this, this private equity example turned up and resulted in an enforcement action. Um, then I think you're going to see a real sort of uh, change of mindset in the private equity industry. And, you know, what I'm urging people to do, and I think everybody has been urging the private equity industry is, hey, you better uh, focus on this. Uh, granted, they have lots of other issues to worry about with the SEC breathing down their necks, but this is just something they don't want to uh, have to do. So how do we look at managing your portfolio uh, and your acquisition risks uh, and risk mapping, mapping your portfolio and risk mapping all the, con con uh, the companies that you have? Uh, and it's a really difficult process, but it really does um, break down on documenting a risk ranking process that focuses on the important issues of geography, interactions with government officials, third parties, gifts and hospitalities, joint ventures, and compliance controls, and, uh, you know, all the usual suspects, as they say. And these are the types of issues that you have to sort of really look at um, and apply a formula to. I hate to go back to my formulas and risk ranking for third parties, but this is a perfect example of how you manage your portfolio risk and allocate resources according to a risk ranking formula. And then that allows you to justify to the government that you actually did something, you focused in a cutting edge way. The, the formula may be kind of rudimentary, but nonetheless it is important um, for you to do something in this area uh, and, and make an effort in terms of monitoring and auditing your portfolio companies uh, as they're operating and auditing and monitoring and whatnot. It also gives you then a, a sort of foundation against which to manage the acquisition risks of a particular company. So let's say you're going to acquire a new company in a private equity context, and then all of a sudden you look at your risk profile of your current risks, and this company comes way low on your risk uh, sort of ranking uh, system. That may inform the way you do your due diligence, how robust your due diligence is. And if you document it and why you did certain things, you're going to be fine when it comes down to it. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I would say, um, um, this is what you really have to do in terms of that. Due diligence, and somebody asked a good question, well, if due diligence is not defined and clear about anti-bribery and anti-corruption procedures, what is its purpose? Well, look, in the end, due diligence is done um, really to document and demonstrate your consideration of relevant risks. Due diligence is a process by which you uh, create a set of procedures to document and consider these risks and weigh these risks and then assign appropriate levels of resources. Is there a formula for it? No, 
but there is what I would call an easy element test, uh, which starts with a risk assessment, which starts in the context of a due diligence. Uh, I can give you 11 to 15 categories of things that should be included on a chart for uh, due diligence purposes, and you can fill them in. So that's my uh, point. It's not defined in terms of you know how much information is needed on a particular thing or how do I weigh something and you know do I put 25 percent on this or do I put five percent there's no formula but there is what I would call certain factors and certain issues that have to be examined and some of them are listed here uh, in this slide so um, covering all your bases in this context in when you're conducting due diligence um, and what exists and what needs to be added is you can create a basic risk matrix which looks at the nature of the business, the countries of operations, the risky inter the, the nature of the interactions with foreign officials, are we selling products, are we not? If you're a sovereign wealth fund, look, let's be, you know, you're dealing with a sovereign wealth fund, it's going to be risky. The question is who are you dealing with there? Uh, you know, if you have third parties that are placement agents, uh, that are helping you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another good question, uh, are there markets in which it is simply imprudent for companies to make acquisitions or hold ownership interests? That's an excellent question, and my answer always is uh, no. Um, there are no markets that you shouldn't get into. My question always is this. I think it's wrong for compliance people to ever tell a business, you cannot go into this area, it's too risky. That means you're not doing your job. You, what you do say is, look, we can go into Russia, we can go into Equatorial Guinea, or we can go into uh, some of these other high-risk places, but we've got to go in with our eyes open. And that means we're going to need more compliance resources up front to design systems to protect ourselves against potential uh, corruption. So. We are always willing to go into any area where the business justifies it, knowing that we're, let's say, our costs may be higher. But here, corruption is never going to be anti-corruption compliance or compliance in general. Money laundering, all of this, is never going to be or never should be the determinant of whether or not a business goes into a market. They can say, here's our cost. It's up to you. If the business justifies it, we'll make it happen and we'll make it work. I may need a person who works full-time on this, but that's going to have to be what we need to do. One of the areas that I do think that private equity companies have to mature in, and if there's, a, I hate to use an analogy with my children, but you know, looking at a three-year-old child is like looking at private equity and culture, and compliance culture, and a culture of ethics and a culture of compliance. And private equity companies, when they have a portfolio of companies, have to engage in communications and activities and infrastructure that allow them to basically establish their culture and to communicate their culture, to uh, do things across organizations, being, let's say, offering webinars, compliance webinars and educational webinars uh, for across portfolios across the portfolio do things that spread your culture across the group and that to me is really important because it's one area private equity doesn't even have the basic due diligence uh, controls in place that they need to in anti-corruption context and can you imagine if we move them even beyond that putting the infrastructure in place over gifts and hospitality, and then we put in the infrastructure for culture. Create a culture within your private equity company. It's not that hard, it's not that difficult, and the benefits are significant, and the costs are very low. It requires attention, um, but you know, a CEO's time uh, is not so valuable that spending an hour on uh, an ethics and compliance issue or communications is going to uh, undermine the company's operations. So we also, in a view, viewing the company uh, and the potential acquisition, we always look at the role of the board, the CEO, the CCO, and other senior manager uh, managers. We review their 
culture as best as we can. We review their policies and procedures to see what they are what they are dealing with uh, in place, what types of operations they have in place, uh, and have uh, and, and go from there. Um, uh, and then we also review their operations. To me, get, and this is done in the context of thinking about integrating the company into our private equity company. Uh, another good question came in. So many acquisition candidates in markets prone to corruption, which also uh, often coincidentally have very high tax rates, um, maintain parallel books. Is there any way to do a compliant deal with a company which has black and white books if one can be comfortable with the commercial case. Uh, and, and I would say yes, uh, there is a way to get through that. That is not unusual to see the two sets of books. Usually these are companies, these are countries where we have um, you know, very active re uh, revenue authorities and tax collectors. And in fact, the biggest risk to the business is being shut down for sort of, let's say, a revenue audit. Uh, and whether or not the company is paying taxes, because you have immature tax collection systems, or uh, you. Uh, but let's talk about a more mature one, which is China, where they really uh, want uh, and aggressively uh, go after companies to ensure proper tax collection. Um, but there are a lot of issues that come up in that context. But yes, you can do the dual books. Uh, you can get that through. You're going to replace their control system. You're going to bring them into a control system. But you're going to have a very big cultural problem when you start off with a company like that. The cultural problem you're going to start off with in a company with two sets of books is, hey, we're used to doing things this way. We avoid taxes. We avoid import fees. We avoid this. And we have another set of books. Uh, and I've seen this uh, particularly in import and customs fees and export fees, where people are always trying to avoid certain fees and want different invoices and different pricing. Um, uh, one other question came in, which is a good one as well. If, uh, among the 50 or so PE firms, private equity firms, there is a clash of cultures. Among them, what are your views? Absolutely. We have private equity companies that have grown and then become uh, very, very big, but they started as, uh, not shoestrings, but they started as small and they started as a startup and the managers who were from those days are still there. And uh, they still run a gigantic company as a startup. That's a dangerous culture versus people who, let's say, were in the more uh, in financial institutions, more heavily regulated and institutionalized places, and then start their own private equity. They know what the controls look like. You may have, a, uh, you may have uh, the reason they go into private equity is to avoid all the regulatory frame, uh, frameworks. But now the SEC is catching up with them. But you still have a real big culture clash between those types of private equity companies and those companies that are uh, sort of more of the startup mentality. So those are, uh, those are you definitely see that in the industry. Integration and incorporation. Well, integration and incorporation is, is, uh, is really often ignored and the cause of major compliance problems. If there's anything I can say, the one number one thing in terms of integration, or let's say two things that needs to be done with regard to integration is train and get your people into the newly acquired company, and number two, have to make sure that their financial system is compatible and they're brought on to all of the financial controls. You do not want a situation where you have a company that's acquired, they use a different, they don't use SAP, let's say, for example, they have a different financial control system, and you say to them, oh, we don't want to upset them too much with all this radical change. Let them keep their system up and running for the next year. That is the worst recipe for disaster I've ever seen. It is not something to do. Bring your people in, get a very well-established integration procedure so that you take control of this company as soon as possible. Don't worry about people's feelings in this context. They know they've been acquired. People are adults. They know that things are going to change, and you go in and you change them. That, that is the time. When you try to coddle people in that situation is when the acquiring company uh, gets into trouble uh, in that situation. So integration steps, 
um, you make sure that your code of conduct and compliance policies uh, you know are applied as quickly as possible you do training like I said uh, you want to get your senior managers trained as quickly as possible in the new company uh, and obviously get the word out in terms of new requirements new things that are going to occur what your internal procedures are as well it's not just training on what the law is or what you know Obviously, you've got to make it relevant to what their day-to-day -day life is. Okay, now you're going to have you're going to be subject to this new. We use Concur for our travel and uh, gifts and whatever reimbursement. Uh, so you're going to have to get them trained on it. You're going to have to show them that and tell them this is the way you get your money back and you get reimbursed or you get your gifts or whatever approved in advance. Um, and you need to get in there, and I know this is, uh, sounds like more work and, you know, a promo for law firms like myself uh, and ours and what we do, but, you know, go in there and do a quick audit uh, of the newly acquired business and, you know, do a very, you know, specific focused audit, and you do have to do this. The reason is because you know your due diligence process is not going to stop a deal. Your due diligence process is only going to be their pre-acquisition due diligence is for making sure this deal, you're going into it with your eyes wide open, you know what the risks are, and your integration planning is going to depend upon how significant this is. And you're going to remediate as much as you can. You're going to go in there, do an audit, just as part of your, in your uh, integration activities is the uh, specific FCPA type audit. Well, thank you very much. We're at the uh, end of the hour. If there are any questions, please let me know. Uh, again, if you do want a copy of the slides, uh, just write me an email. I'll send them to you uh, today. Uh, number two, don't forget uh, the Bullfuck Law Group. We do provide services across all of these areas uh, that we've mentioned in particular uh, with regard to compliance and interactions with sovereign wealth funds, um, uh, pre-acquisition due diligence, post-acquisition integration, post-acquisition audits, uh, those types of things. Number three, don't forget uh, individual webinars are available now for eight bucks on the Volkoff Law TV uh, site, and you're more than happy, uh, more than happy uh, to talk to you about any type of company-wide type of service that you need and access to the webinars. We make it very affordable because it's important to get the message out. Um, thank you again. Um, remember our website, uh, Bullpup Law. Follow us on LinkedIn. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, our blog, uh, follow. Uh, we write about uh, private equity a lot. Uh, this, uh, we won't have recordings of this, like I have tried to emphasize, we won't have recordings of this um, with regard to, uh, you know, available. Uh, we, uh, it will only be available on Bullpuck Law TV, but the slides themselves will be available uh, uh, if you email me and I'll send them to you. Uh, other than that, after a few days, they go up onto the um, uh, Bullpuck Law TV site and then are not available for dissemination without uh, buying you know, that individual webinar. All right, thank you again. Uh, enjoy your day. It's a beautiful day. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Please.